Hey, everyone. I want to talk about education law, which is an area of law that you probably might not even be aware of. Um, I'll tell you what, 10 years ago when I left law school, I had no idea that you could be a lawyer practicing education law. When uh, my first boss in Florence told me that I'd be doing education law, I said, am I going to be like teaching law students? What, what do you, I don't know anything. I just left law school. She said, no, no, no. You're going to be representing families in public school. Um, and so let's, let's talk about the, the, the general areas in which legal aid represents families um, in the education context. There's four general areas that we can break it down to. Number one with a bullet here is discipline. So school suspensions and expulsions. And um, that's the bulk of our work. Um, and I, I'm, we're going to go through kind of the basic law on that so you're familiar with it. Um, we get a, I always get a lot of questions about suspensions and expulsions because unfortunately, it just it impacts a lot of a lot of kids. Um, and unfortunately, you know, uh, survivors of crime and their kids, you know, there they can be it's a traumatic experience. Kids can act out and work through their trauma, work through their um, their issues in various ways, and they can manifest themselves in um, disciplinary issues at school. Um, and sometimes the school might be cool and understanding, and sometimes they won't care. Um, so it's important to know, you know the, the general law about that. The second area, and kind of my focus, my vocational focus uh, for my um, career, I guess I can say career now that I've been doing this for 10 years, um, and my hair is getting gray, uh, is special education. Um, so that's federal law that uh, usurps state law and requires schools to provide certain services to kids who have special needs. Um, that also has a discipline component, which is very helpful, which keeps kids in schools. Um, the third area is access. So that includes um, 504 plans, if you've ever heard of that. We'll just do some cursory explanations of what that is. Um, language access. Um, so Scott mentioned LEP, that's limited English proficiency. Um, some of you uh, advocates that, that I work with know that I speak Spanish. And um, so I, I have a, a large part of my practice are um, limited English proficiency clients who either speak Spanish as a primary language or another language. Um, and, you know, they, as you you all know they come with a, a special set of, of barriers, and uh, so that that's part of my work is is working through those barriers with those clients to get them um, equity and justice. Um, also, part of this is uh, school enrollment, which I think probably as I'm thinking through like what ad advocates like y'all are going to be um, touching on in your practice, um, probably enrollment. So we're going to touch on enrollment as you know, your uh, your clients, uh, your victims, your survivors are are moving school districts and maybe having some issues getting kids enrolled that way. And the fourth area is bullying, and we'll just touch briefly on that. So, discipline, suspensions, and expulsions. Um, so here's the code section on this. Um, administrators have the authority to suspend a pupil from class or from school. Um, no more than ten days for one incident and not more than 30 days for a whole school year. And that 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 mirrors the federal special education law. Um, but it's important to keep in mind because um, a lot of schools are doing something that we have kind of affectionately called sneaky suspensions. So instead of actually formally suspending a kid out of school, marking that as, as a suspended day on, uh, on power school, um, they just call mom and dad and they say, come pick up your kid. Um, we're not having it today. And you, so you, uh, you, you, know, you take a half day off of work and, um, you leave your employer in the lurch and, uh, you go pick your kid up and bring them home because the, the school says so. And, um, we call those sneaky suspensions because those aren't always marked. And it's important to mark them because um, it, even in the non-special education context, just the regular education context, if you've got more than 30 of those, then you're in violation of statute. 
Um, and and honestly, if you're if you're doing that, you know, the question for me as an attorney looking at it is, wait, if this kid is having so many issues in school, is there some kind of undiagnosed behavioral um, mental health issue that this kid has? Does this kid need to be in therapy because maybe they've gone through a traumatic incident where they saw their mom hurt? Um, like that, that's a real question that that I start asking. And the, the school is required to begin asking once there's there's a pattern evolving. So, um, you know, it's important to, to make sure that we're not writing kids off as, oh, that's that's just a bad kid. And no one's going to say that out loud, but you can feel that in the room sometimes. Um, or you can see it in the record when you're looking at, at a new case and you go, oh, gosh, uh, the school's kind of written this kid off as a bad kid. Um, so that's the basics on suspensions. An important thing um, that lots of folks ask for is, is you know, what, what kind of notice, what kind of appeal rights do I have? It, there's some. So the, the administrator, typically the vice principals, got to notify the parents in writing, setting forth a reason for the suspension. And they give you a date and a time within three days to have a conference. So essentially, they'll they'll send an email typically or a letter home that says, we suspended your kid out of school for three days for fighting. Um, here's the section of the code of conduct that, that talks about you can't fight. Um, the vice principal is available at 2.30 tomorrow. Um, and if you're not available at 2.30, uh, the school's not technically required to reschedule it for you. Most of them probably will try and do that, but um, they have checked all their boxes for the statute if they have just done that within three days and given you an opportunity to, to attend a conference. Um, and you just get to have a, a, a give and take back and forth conversation with the school about whether or not that's an appropriate thing to do, to, whether there's sufficient evidence to support a suspension. Um, you can appeal that to the school board. Um, and, you know, the school board is generally elected. There, there, there is an election, you know, coming up. Um, you can early vote right now uh, for your school board members. So they're a little bit more beholden to the public. And they're also not all career educators. So they, they typically can bring a unique perspective, a good perspective um, to discipline issues. Um, but... Once the once the big board, the school board, has made a decision on a suspension, you cannot appeal that further. You do not have an, an appellate right to circuit court after that. So it's just an internal school thing. Um, the other thing on suspensions I like to mention is a lot of times the school, instead of um, instead of suspending um, or expelling, the school will just transfer that kid to what we call alternative school. Right, so that's either a charter or it's just a special middle high school that deals with um, kids who have disciplinary issues. Um, and some of those schools are are great at um, kind of resetting, training those kids, and then putting them back in in their normal education system. And sometimes that that those buildings are just housing um, kids that have been written off. And they are getting the bare minimum and they're getting kicked out the door to say, good luck. Expulsion. So um, the, the biggest difference between suspension and expulsion is, uh, well, there's a lot of them, but you've got, you're losing a lot more when you're expelled. You're losing a school year. Um, and our, our, uh, our Supreme Court has said that you've got a property right in your public education, which means you get due process. And due process just means you get a right to have notice, you get a right to have counsel, and you get the right to have a fair independent hearing. So um, you've got a lot more rights when it comes to an expulsion. Now, I, the reason why I cut and pasted this code section is because I wanted, I always like to overemphasize how much authority the school has to expel kids. So any district board of trustees, that's the, the school board, may authorize or order the expulsion, suspension, or transfer of any pupil for the commission of any crime, okay, um, gross immorality, I'm not sure what that means, 
gross misbehavior, okay? Persistent disobedience, persistent disobedience. So what, is that two or three times you um, talk back to the teacher? Or for violation of the written rules and promulgated regulations established by the district board. So as most of you know, the, every school district has a, a code of conduct, a student code of conduct. So you put something in there, um, then you can expel for it. Uh, that's simple. Um, and even if it's not there, um, look at this or at the very end of the statute, or when the presence of the pupil is detrimental to the best interests of the school. Hmm. I, I hear that one a lot. So uh, that's the catch all there. So I, schools have a lot of authority to expel kids, unfortunately. Um, the, the one carve out that our legislature decided to put in the law is that you can't, you can't expel a kid for buying a lottery ticket underage. <laughs> so of all, of all the things to protect kids from, um, you know, we, we have decided in the state to uh, protect kids from expulsion if they happen to buy themselves a lottery ticket underage. Um, I just wonder, I always wonder how that came about. Uh, so. Um, which legislature's uh, daughter or son uh, was caught buying a lottery ticket, and they decided, "Oh gosh, we got to we uh, we got to carve out something special." All right, hearings. So um, when you are recommended for expulsion, you have to be notified in writing of the time and place of a hearing. You've got right to legal counsel and all the other regular rights that you'd expect. You get to um, cross-examine witnesses. You get to present your side and your own witnesses and your own evidence, all that. Um, boards and hearing officers like to overemphasize how informal the process is um, only because they, they don't want you to participate. Um, but it's, this is extremely important <laughs> to participate and, and say your side of things. Um, you've got the right to appeal the decision uh, to the big board. So e either party, um, I recently won an expulsion case at the lower level, and the school administrators decided to appeal it to the big board. Um, they didn't like that that the kid was being kept in school, uh, so um, and that, so that appeal was heard last night. Um, but either party can do that. The hearing has to take place within 15 days of the written notification. So the the timeline is this: you can be suspended for uh, for any incident for no more than 10 days, right? So a lot of times you'll be suspended. There's an investigation. Within the, those 10 days, the school needs to decide whether or not to recommend you for expulsion. If they recommend you for expulsion, they got to give you a notice. The hearing has to happen within 15 days of that notice. And then the decision has to be rendered within 10 days of the hearing. So essentially, most of the time, two, three, four weeks, your kid is out of school. Um, you, they're missing a month um, for just based on the, the statutory timeline. Um, the exception to, to all of this is if you bring a gun to school. Um, so and let me go back to if I mentioned this. Uh, the, the, the decision typically for an expulsion is uh, if it doesn't involve a gun, is you are expelled for the remainder of the school year, not a calendar year, but the school year. So if you're recommended for expulsion in May, you're, you're not expelled till the following May. It's just through June. And then you, you uh, re-enroll your kid the next year and you're back. The exception to that is with guns. Um, if a school, if, if a student brings a gun to school or the, or the bus or the bus stop, um, then you can be expelled for 365 days. So that is what we call, you know, just a, a zero tolerance policy. And um, I, I roll my eyes when I say that because it's not really a zero tolerance policy. Um, it's uh, in practice, it's implemented um, unfairly and uh, disfavors uh, families of color. It disfavors families um, who are lower income, but also 
um, this zero tolerance policy is subject to modification by a case on a case by case basis by the district superintendent. Um, now, I have never, I, I don't, I don't think I've ever had a superintendent cut the three sixty five day short. Um, they just shrug and go, "Well, that's our policy." We, they, he brought a gun, um, but that's that's in there, and it 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 adds some. Um, some dark humor to the whole zero tolerance policy. Um, so the appeals here, you can appeal to the school board, right? Um, and they should say only, only expulsions can be appealed to the circuit court within 10 days. So that's the, the, the biggest difference between an expulsion and a suspension with regard to appeal rights is if your kid is expelled from school by the, the big school board, within 10 days, you can appeal that to circuit court. So you're having a, a learned judge um, sit and hear your appeal hearing. Um, and we have represented clients in appeals all the way up to the Court of Appeals, and we've won. Um, the one case that I can think of was it was litigated by now Honorable um, Kameka Nichols Graham, a family court judge uh, from Greenville. She used to be in the position that I'm in, and she appealed a decision expelling a kid um, because the so the, the school suspended this um, this young woman for going into the men's bathroom. They had no evidence about what happened in there. Her testimony was she was going in there to just, just to help a friend um, who was having a, a hard day. Um, she denied any kind of sexual contact, but the school just assumed that they were going in there to, to fool around. Um, and all they had was a video. And of course, they, they didn't play the video at the expulsion hearing, but the people that, that saw the video uh, explained what they saw. Um, and the Court of Appeals said there's not substantial evidence to show that this young woman violated your rules. She went into a bathroom that you can't expel her for that. Um, so that's a case that legal aid won way up on appeal. All right. Special ed. Let me pause. Are there any questions in the chat, Scott? Are you? Is anyone monitor monitoring this thing? No one is? No, Ooh. I am. Yeah, there's no oh, questions are? in the chat. Sweet. Oh, no Thanks, buddy. Yep. Hey, all right. I was trying to call you out, but man, it didn't work. <laughs> um, all right. So special education, this, uh, when we're talking about IEPs, right? So an individualized education plan. And we're going to blow through this pretty quickly, but it's it's really, really important. Um so we let me. I don't know if anyone's plugged. I'm sure Susie plugged our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel is is pretty awesome. It's full of videos. I've done way too many on on education and special education. I, I have a. I'm currently three parts into a four part series where I go through an actual IEP document uh, line by line. It's taking forever because we, we're getting deep into the woods, um, into the into the woods or into the weeds. Um, is it a Sondheim play or is it an idiom? So, um, so I'll just refer you to that. So to get an IEP, um, step one, you establish the student has a qualifying disability. Um, typically, you know, a diagnosis from your pediatrician is gonna be sufficient, but sometimes, you know, like the DSM doesn't overlap specifically with the qualifications under special ed. So it's not always a slam dunk, but you get a you get a qualifying disability is step one. Step two is the really important part. That disability impacts their learning such that they require specialized instruction. That just means um, if you've got ADHD and it's not, it doesn't require you to have to, to get pulled out of class, for instance and go see the special ed teacher for math help, um, then you don't get an IEP. So just because you have a disability, just because you have you know, uh, low grades, doesn't automatically qualify you for an IEP. And it's a very complicated process, but those are the, the two basic steps. So the disability and then the, the connection, the nexus between the disability and your need for specialized instruction. If you need some kind of support like speech therapy or physical therapy, um, counseling, those are not specialized instructions, so that wouldn't merit an IEP. 
Um, how do you get an IEP? This is important for people to just kind of know about. Um, you, you could just request one. Um, request an evaluation in writing and give your consent to the evaluation. So the process begins with the school evaluating the student. So the school district employs what, what are called school psychologists. They're master's level psychologists. They, they don't have a PhD. They don't um, work um, anywhere outside of the context of a school. Um, so they have a very limited license, but they their job is to evaluate kids for possible services. Um, that's their job, their full-time job. And a, like a, a district like Charleston County employs dozens of them. Um, request an evaluation, that's probably an overstatement, probably a dozen. Um, so you request the evaluation and give your consent because that starts the clock. Whenever you can you consent to um, to give for the school to conduct the evaluation of your kid, um, they've got 60 calendar days to complete that evaluation. And a lot of times what happens is the the, the mom, mom or dad, they ask for um, an evaluation or they say, I, I, I think I, my, my child needs IEP services. And they say, yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. The school just kind of bats them away. Um, and then six months later, mom comes back and says, no, I, I seriously, like what, what happened to that? And they go, oh, um, yeah, sorry. We'll, uh, what we'll do is we'll, we'll get a meeting scheduled. And they schedule a meeting for the next month. And uh, you go to the meeting and they go, okay, cool. So let's look at, um, I guess we should do an evaluation. Mom, can you sign the consent? Sure. So you sign the consent. And then at that moment, the 60 days starts. So the six, seven months prior, um, you have not started the clock for the evaluation. Now you can go back and, and potentially argue that the school should have known to conduct that evaluation, but that's a, an analysis that a lawyer will have to make for you. So the, those six months, seven months aren't lost necessarily, but you haven't started the clock yet. They have 60 calendar days, not school days, calendar days to complete the evaluation. Doesn't matter if it's during holidays or summer, there's no exception. You And you hear schools, you know, they don't want to work in the summer. They don't want to work during Christmas. They got 60 days. So however they want to figure out, you know, their vacations, go for it. Once the evaluation is complete, the IEP team um, will conduct a meeting and the issue will be eligibility. Does your kid qualify for an IEP? And um, hopefully if the school has done the evaluation appropriately, they'll do a, a huge battery of tests. I mean, this, this thing should be 20, 30 pages long um, and super dense. What happens if you're denied? If at that meeting, um, they say, sorry, your kid just doesn't qualify for IEP services. You've got two options. You can consult with a lawyer and you can file what's called a due process hearing request. Um, there's a two-year statute of limitations when you choose this option. So you call legal aid, you refer your client to legal aid. Um, and we've got two years that, that typically a client comes in, I go, all right, what's your immediate issue? Great. Let's fit. Let's fix that. Okay. Um, what other issues have we got in the, in the last two years? How have they been denying you um, services? Option two is to file a complaint with the State Department of Ed. Um, a lot of people choose this because you don't have to have a lawyer. Um, the draw There's a couple of drawbacks. I don't like using this process. One is there's a one-year statute of limitations on these. Two is um, I'm not in control really of the relief. Um, Best case scenario is let's say you win. There's a letter that's issued, a decision letter issued saying the school needs to do a couple things. And there's, there's the, a debate about whether or not there's actual teeth that, um, that the State Department can or is willing to use um, to uh, enforce that. So, but that's an option. What if they're not implementing? So you've got an IEP and it's just not being followed. They're not providing all the services. Let's say during COVID, they didn't, they didn't do much or anything. You are entitled to compensatory services for that. They're not implementing it. That, that needs to be addressed. Same two options. What if it's not appropriate? What if the, they have an IEP, they are implementing it, but it's just not enough. Um, they're just kind of, uh, they're skirting by, they're pushing this kid through and they're doing just bare minimum. 
same two options. That that's a, that's that's a one of the more common issues that I see. All right. Um, looking at my time here. Cool. So of the four things now, we've got the third thing that uh, legal aid does with education law, and that's about access. So enrollment. Let's sit here for a second. Enrolling a kid in school. So you know we we have residency requirements um, in this state, just like every state does, right? So you have to prove um, that you reside in the school district to be enrolled for free there. Um, now, in the case of a survivor of domestic violence who has been placed in temporary housing, what do you do there? Well, there are, there are exceptions. Um, you can. It, at that point, if you're technically homeless, you're unhoused, you are in transition housing, um, you can elect to stay in your in your previous school district, or you can elect to enroll in, in the school district in which you are currently residing. Um, most people, most parents are going to just hopefully try and keep their kids in the same school district, and the school district needs to work with you on that. There's, there's something called the McKinney-Vento Act. It's a, it's an act that that's a law passed by Congress many years ago um, to help the unhoused, including domestic violence victims, um, to to access school. And if you're having issues with that, if your client's having issues with that, then legal aid can help. Um, honestly, it 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 just takes one email or one phone call from me to their lawyer, and they go, "Oh my God, we're so embarrassed." They fix it. Um, so there's also uh, an affidavit that you can find online or on our website about about enrollment. Um, but uh, honestly, if you can get a legal aid lawyer to just make a phone call for you, that's the best thing. Um, 504 plans. Um, so the the other option for a kid with a disability who doesn't have the need to have specialized instruction is a 504 plan. And 504, it, it, that's the, the code section that this comes from. And essentially it's about um, leveling the playing field and giving equal access to kids with disabilities. And that's, that's interpreted very broadly, thankfully. So it can be anything from a wheelchair ramp as like you see here, that's a physical access thing, right? To uh, allow a, a child to physically access a building and the same opportunities. Another access issue is behavior. So if your behavior is the result of your disability and your behavior is causing you to have disciplinary issues that uh, kick you out of school, um, you don't have equal access. Because if you're at home on OSS or if you're in ISS because of your disability, well, then you don't, you don't have the same access as um, an able-bodied, as, as a non-disabled peer. So, and that's discrimination. So a 504 plan can also involve a behavioral intervention plan to make sure that a kid with a disability who has behavior issues because of their disability can, um, can remain in school pursuant to this plan. And it really, it's kind of like a, like a flow chart where step one, we, we do this for the child. Step two, if step one doesn't work, we try and do this. Step three is then we try and do this. Um, so all these interventions to try and keep this kid in school, in addition to, let's say, we need, we need to give him therapy. We need um, the, the uh, special ed teacher to teach this child how to, um, how to cope with adversity, how to manage their emotions, that sort of thing. Um, reasonable accommodations, most folks are aware of that. That's like, you know, just like in work, right? So a, a reasonable accommodation that, uh, that your disability requires, um, you can get that as well. So the 504 versus the IEP, a lot of people think, oh, well, the 504 is kind of like a watered down IEP. Um, that's not really the right way to think about it. Um, you know, 504 plan might be the appropriate plan for your kid. Um, and you can do a lot with a 504 plan. A lot of parents don't know that, that you can, you can get lots of services. You can get um, speech therapy, you can get um, counseling. So you can do this behavioral intervention plan. Um, and, you know, the, again, the question is, does your kid require specialized instruction because of their disability? So that, if so, then they get the IEP. 
The other thing that we touch on is language access. That's another kind of pet project of mine since I, I represent a lot of Spanish speakers. Um, we have we were we continue to be part um, of an ongoing push in South Carolina to increase language access for families of public school students who don't speak English at home. Um, the majority of them are Spanish speaking, but there's plenty of Portuguese speaking and Russian speaking and the list goes on, right? Um, so uh, what public schools have to do is give equal access to those families. And that means if they send stuff home in writing, it's gotta be translated in that family's language. Um, if that parent calls up or, or shows up and wants information, wants to talk to the teacher or the vice principal, they need to make interpreters available. Um, there was recently, as a result of, of uh, some of our clients who filed some complaints with the Department of Justice, there was a big settlement that was reached in um, Charleston County, um, unrelated to legal aid, um, but a similar um, agreement was reached in Horry County. Um, so the Department of Justice is looking at South Carolina and um, has, has reached a bunch of resolutions with school districts, which, re which require the school districts to beef up the supports um, and, and the language access. So uh, just make sure, make sure if, if your clients are not English speaking, that they're able to access uh, the schools the same way. Um, Oh, Nelson. Thanks, buddy. Nelson, what a he's well, what a great guy you are, man. Thank you so much. I just got a, a compliment in the chat. You don't have to read it, but if you do, um, cool. So bullying. Um, I'll just touch base on this really, really quickly. So there was a big push, you know, anti-bullying in the last decade or so. Um, and it amounted to this. We have a law in South Carolina that says um, we want schools to be safe and free from bullying and harassment. So every school district needs to have an anti-bullying policy. Cool, bye. That's it. That, that's the extent of the statute. So, um, you know, as, as these things go, every school district has basically the same anti-bullying, anti-harassment policy. And it's where you have to notify a specific person in writing. Sometimes it's the teacher, but typically it's like an administrator, like the vice principal or the principal. Sometimes it's the superintendent for some reason, but um, you have to follow their procedures. So you have to notify them in writing and it has to be that person. Um, and typically there's a meeting scheduled. You guys talk about um, what's happening. In my experience, the school says, well, uh, you know, your student, is also an aggressor. Your student was enticing them to fight. Your student was doing this. And it might be true, it might not. Um, but these meetings can be really frustrating. And at the end of the day, what's your remedy? Well, your remedy is to go hire a personal injury attorney and sue them for um, gross negligence, basically. And, and in that kind of case, you'd have to prove you know, physical or psychological harm to your kid that the school knew or should have known about that they were grossly negligent in preventing. Um, it's not much of a remedy, I'll tell you that. Uh, but legal aid, we don't take personal injury cases. So basically I get to I get to walk in there with um not even a carrot. I don't but maybe like half of a carrot, but no stick. I don't have it, I don't have a stick to to wield to say, well, if you don't don't listen, I can use this stick. Nope. Um I get to say, Sorry, they're <laughs> have to go hire someone else. So it's, I, I get really frustrated talking about bullying because our, the remedies that we have available are not not helpful. So um, that is the basics of what we do for education clients at Legal Aid. Um, let me see if there are any questions. <laughs> 